Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. It is a sunny Friday morning here in Seattle, which has me feeling very happy today. So I am excited to be uh, doing this live stream and we have uh, one excited viewer already. Welcome, Slug Biker. I'm glad you could join me again for this Friday Features. Uh, unlike last week where we did a lot of dexterity games and had me demonstrate my non-balancing skills, this week we're back to our uh, more traditional board game show where I have picked out five games that will be uh, featured all week starting today through next Thursday and will be on sale at 20% off in-store curbside pickup or delivery options are available. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And if you're watching later on YouTube, thanks for tuning in. All right, so I don't have a young kids game to start us off, but our feature designer is Uwe Rosenberg. And he is a German board game designer that has been designing games for the last probably close to 30 years now. And I'm starting off with one of his more classic titles. This is Bonanza. To bean or not to bean. <laughs> Most people will come into the store and ask if we have the bean game. So it is lovingly called the bean game. And it has been out since about 1997. So this in the board game world is a, a classic. It has to be uh, at this point. So it's a great grandparent of card games and <laughs> it's still a lot of fun. It's for two to seven players and it is about harvesting and planting beans might be chili beans or wax beans or coffee beans or blue beans red beans i think there's like 11 different beans in the game and all players are going to start out with some bean fields in front of them where beans can be planted a couple of those and a hand of cards what makes this game interesting and unique and still different from a lot of things I've even seen today is that when you were dealt your hand of cards, that is the order that you have to play those cards. So you can't just reorganize and sort and put things close to each other. Right now, the only bean available to me is this red bean. If I'm super excited by say this coffee bean here at the back of my hand, I'd have to wait till I plant or uh, deal with all of the beans that are in front of me bef before I can plant that coffee bean. So you can't just like bump something up in the order. You have to pay very close attention to the uh, way that your hand is situated. And on your turn, what you're doing is you're gonna be planting a bean into an open field. Hopefully you have another bean of that type that you can put it on the exact same type. You can't put a, a red bean on top of a green bean. I mean, that's Christmas, that's ridiculous. Um, so a red bean has to go on a red bean or an empty field. And uh, you are welcome to then plant the second bean, my little soybean here, if I have a place for my soybean and I should want to. But you're never allowed to plant that third one. That's just gonna have to wait for the next turn. Uh, but you have to plant the first one. Now, what if I don't have an empty field or uh, the, another red bean field already on the go? I have to choose one of my fields to harvest and sell. And the goal of the game is to try to collect multiples of one bean in a field in order to get more coins. So this one is saying, if I had three green beans when I go to sell, I will get one coin. But if I have seven green beans, I'm gonna get four coins. And the other neat mechanic that I have seen in other games since like Port Royal and things like that, uh, the back of the cards are the coins that you are collecting for the game. So when I get rid of those three green beans and collect one coin, I would keep one of those cards in my coin stack indicating how much money I have earned and discard the rest of the beans. The other fun thing that happens in the game is after you've done your planting and rearranging and selling so that you can play down the card you must play, you're gonna turn over two cards and then you're gonna be able to take that card to be planted right now or offer it up for trade and try to get things from other players uh, hands like I have uh, one uh, yellow bean I would like to have uh, a red bean so does anyone have red beans and then players can then take an exchange with the active player they can't exchange with themselves they can only exchange with the person who's the active player at this time but hopefully they'll be getting beans that they want and you'll be getting more beans that you want you can also just offer to donate beans if you don't want to make trades or you've got nothing that you uh, uh, want to add to your fields uh, but that's kind of a last uh, resort, and then the players would just be able to take uh, that bean themselves. 
So over the course of rounds, you are trying to plant in one, two, or three fields. The third field, you have to uh, be able to pay for it. It costs three coins, so it's after you've already been harvesting a little bit. And then you have a little more uh, flexibility with what you can plant and on and on until the end of the game when you're going to count up and see who has earned the most money from all of their bean farming. There are special rules for, I think, three players and two players that sort of uh, make it a little bit more of a, a good mechanic for that. Uh, less number of players since it's more of an interaction game for larger groups. I'd say it's best at like five players. Um, there is a two player version of Bonanza that's been out for some time, just a few years now. Uh, that kind of makes it a nice tighter experience for the two players. So uh, <laughs> I wouldn't uh, necessarily uh, suggest this version for two players, although it does work if you sometimes have two but often have more players. I know this time of year it's nice to have the lower player counts. This time of year, this year, this forever period. So that's Bonanza from Uwe Rosenberg. It's an older game from him, but we still have it very much in stock and in print. It's normally $19.95, but it will be 20% off for the rest of this week. Yeah, it is very unusual to have to drop down player count, although it's nice to do so in that it kind of allows some games that would be too loose with or uh, too tight with two players to adjust to that, that player count. All right, so what I have next is probably one of Uwe's most well-known games. And oh, do you show your hand? How do folks know you? Well, I mean, you, you're going to be holding your cards up uh, in front of you. And so, I mean, it is an honesty thing. I guess you could put it under the table and rearrange them. But that's cheating. It's like taking extra money from the bank in Monopoly. And I wouldn't uh, want to play with somebody who does that, although... I've never understood why people cheat in a board game because I feel like, what joy do you derive from from that win? I, to each their own. I, I think I mentioned a couple weeks ago that I learned Sophia Loren really liked to cheat at the game of Scrabble and she considered that half of the fun and that's why no one wanted to play with her. All right, anyway, so that is um, the honesty in, in, in Bonanza is keep your hand visible. Um, all right, so next I have Patchwork, which is a, the most well-known Uwe Rosenberg game. It's been out for probably only about 10 years now. I'm not sure, but it's a two-player game only. And it is got a few versions on different themes. You can get Christmas tiles, and you can get Americana if you really, really like your red, white, and the blue. And uh, there's also an Express version, which is a little more accessible for younger audiences. Um, so... Oh yeah, it makes this, someone says in the chat, it makes this harder for those who like to shuffle our cards, yes. So then you want to play Dominion. <laughs> All right, uh, back to patchwork. So this is a puzzly game for two players and it has a set of uh, these little quilt patchwork tiles that are in these polygonical, polynomial, what is the word? Um, just gonna blank on its shapes like Tetris. And you are trying to collect these shapes to place them onto your empty quilt to cover up as many spaces as you can. At the end of the game, all the empty spaces are going to count against you. Yeah, these look cool because they are cool. This is why this game is so popular because it is uh, very satisfying for kind of all ages. Uh, adults, younger kids, and you are just trying to cover up as much of your board as you can with these shapes. Now, uh, obviously you can't go over top of other pieces, you can't hang off of the board, sometimes you're going to be leaving yourself little gaps that are a little bit harder to fill. Um, but how it, it functions is also one of the neatest things. It's going to cost you buttons which uh, you will earn from having on your quilt at certain points in the timing board. And it's also gonna cost you time. This is gonna cost you three spaces. And that's done on this center board. So both players are gonna start at the edge and you're gonna work your way around all the way to the center, which is the end of the game. Whoever is in last place is gonna be able to take their next turn and whichever tile they select, they're going to move that number of timed spaces forward. So some of them are very expensive. They cost six time spaces. So you're wasting quite a bit of the game to take this tile, 
but if you'll note it has uh, three buttons on it and I mentioned that you can earn back those buttons every time your time marker passes one of these spaces all the buttons you have sewn on your board you then earn in little token button tiles that allow you to then pay the cost for these future tiles so it's a balance between getting the big ones to cover the spaces but not spend too much time but maybe spending enough time to cover your board in, in, in button pieces so that you can have a larger income to afford more tiles to be able to cover uh, more spaces on your player board. Uh, the player who's in last gets to go next. So if you take less time, you may get multiple turns in a row before you pass your opponent's piece. If you can't afford any buttons, there's a mechanic that allows you to skip forward to take some extra buttons. Uh, passing your turn but collecting buttons instead so you're not completely stuck but uh, it's a, a great little tight puzzle for two players and it is I, I, I've never not had fun playing it it's very easy to teach and play uh, uh, Sola she in the chat says don't expect a higher even positive score that is correct because if you have a lot of empty spaces at the end that's gonna be a bunch of negative points you do score points for your leftover buttons so um, it's one that can be played kind of over and over again you get better at it as you play a little bit but what's available in the marketplace i didn't quite in get into that you don't have all the tiles available all the time uh it can be tricky and you just don't have the options that you need and yes uh slug biker each person is covering their own board and uh so you, you don't have to fight over the space of the board the fight between the players is over which tiles are available because there is a marker that is moving around a circle of these of these quilt tiles and you're only able to take the three tiles that are in front of that marker and then it will move to the empty space making more of the circle available and you kind of go around and around collecting the tiles so you might see the tile that you really want on the other side of the circle but you'll have to wait till you get there before you can fill it in there are little individual pieces that you can pass on this board that allow you to play in those empty spaces um, but those are sort of just little extra bonuses so that is patchwork it is normally $29.95, but it will be on sale till next Thursday, March <laughs> something. I don't know. It's 13, 14, 19th, I think. I don't know. What day is it? I've been in my house for 364 days today, so sometime in March. All right, um, yes, definitely one of the best two player, Polyomino, that's the word I was looking for earlier, board game spam, thank you very much. Polyominoes, eh, like dominoes, but they're poly-sided shapes. Uh, <laughs> it is just one of the best two player games, I think, period, cards, dominoes, or otherwise. All right, next up, I have the next kind of, not brand new, but only a couple year old game that is by Uwe Rosenberg that was also uh, a co-designer from somebody uh, whose name I'm not going to say uh, without saying a French accent, Corne van Morsel. I think it is a Dutch name. I don't actually know, but he designed another game uh, that he Uwe used a lot of the components and elements from, so he gave him a kind of a co-designing credit on that. And uh, uh, so Nova Luna is a uh, abstract game, sort of like Patchwork, which is why I wanted to piggyback it on uh, that discussion. So this one I have over on uh, the camera, just because I'm going to play just a couple little rounds so you get an idea of it, since it's sort of one that flew under the radar in the last few years. So Nova Luna doesn't have a board like Patchwork. It has... Um, a <laughs> slug biker says next Thursday the 18th and they looked it up thank you um <laughs> oh and Joy and Rob are joining me hello nice to see uh some people I haven't seen in over a year now uh okay so this is Nova Luna and the the game itself there's no uh board for you to cover up but you are still gonna be collecting pieces and these are very much just gonna be uh little squares they're not uh polyominoes at all uh, but the puzzle is in how these different tiles are placed in your play area in relation to each other. But the similarities to Patchwork, or if I can move this camera up, 
you are going to be moving around this circle to claim uh, these pieces, but you can only take from the moon marker and above, uh, I think one, two, or three spaces. And it also has a number on it, which is going to, like patchwork, be the amount of time that you have to spend uh, to move forward on, on this circle. So if I took this one, I'd have to move two spaces. I would then claim this tile, which gets added to my play area. So we're gonna go back down here. And um, now whoever is behind me in this circle is gonna be able to take their turn. So you're sort of, again, whoever is farther back might be able to take multiple turns if they take the lower number tiles. In this game, the higher number tiles take more time, but the uh, the lower numbers are, are gonna take less time, but they're gonna be a little bit harder to complete. So what these tiles mean, and I'll pull down a few of these so you can look at them here, is what uh, squares are placed next to this one uh, need to be specific colors. So this one is asking for there to be four dark blue tiles directly adjacent to this one. So you're saying, oh, there's, well, there's one, two, three, four sides orthogonally adjacent. That's another wonderful board game term. This is orthogonal. This is diagonal. So orthogonal being the opposite of diagonal is going to be, you want four of the dark blue around this tile. So wow, that's really hard. You would need to have uh, one on each side. Now, there is one exception to that and that you can chain uh, the like colors that are next to each other. So I could have, um, I don't have another dark blue tile in my example board here. If I had something like this, it's now going to have two blue next to it. So it's not directly orthogonally adjacent to it, but the other blue one is orthogonally adjacent to this tile. So I have two towards the four that I need to collect. So again, this didn't cost very much time, but that's still really hard to do. I didn't even have four blue tiles out in, on my board. Those would have to be drawn later from the, the face down piles that get added to that circular uh, board. So these bigger number ones are gonna be a little bit easier. So you'd see on here, I would just need two yellow tiles to go next to it in order to um, be able to complete that little uh, goal. Now you're saying, okay, so what's the point? Do you score the points from it? Are you trying to cover up all the, the goals on each of your tiles? No, you start the game with a certain number of uh, circle discs. And if you are playing your first few games, you can uh, start with less discs because the game is a race. The first person to place all of their discs on completed goals wins the game. It doesn't matter if I have done some awesome combos and I'm one away, it's just a race to see whoever can place these discs first. So if I completed one of these goals on this tile that said two yellow and I had a yellow here and a yellow here, I would be able to cover up that piece uh, and get rid of one of my discs. So you want to be able to maybe find tiles that maybe it was like this to complete the yellow and then later I claimed this tile and placed it here. Oh look, it's already touching two yellows so I'd be able to play down. And maybe there was already two blue over here or something so that you could then go ahead and, and uh, get uh, that one completed as well, getting rid of more and more of your tokens, racing to get rid of those discs. It is um, uh, one that can be played solo. Uh, it has a different little mechanic for you to race against the board's clock uh, to get rid of discs early on. And then the second phase is trying to place as many of your discs with as few uh, tiles and with lowest numbers as possible. So you are um, still getting that same feel of trying to get rid of all of your discs. So that is Nova Luna, which is only a couple years old. It's very much a puzzly abstract game, definitely for fans of patchwork, but it is different in the way that it has spatial relation to each other by those colors and the patterns that you have to create from those colors, not how they relate um, geometrically to each other. Uh, let's check in to see if there's any more questions. Nope, but that's great. Uh, we're moving right along. So the last two games that I have saved are some of Ube's newest, well, his newest and one of his most beloved big heavy strategy games. Now I know viewers out there watching are saying, well, of his most beloved big strategy game was Agricola or Agricola. 
I've never known how to say that Latin word. I was watching, I think it's uh, Dead Poets Society. One of the teachers is conjugating Latin verbs and it's the one for farming. And he's like, agricola, agricole. And I was like, still doesn't help me. <laughs> which, which tense of this word is it? But anyway, agricola is not one of the games I'm featuring, but it is probably his most well-known large box game. And it is... Uh, led to a bunch of other games that sort of have the same kind of um, farming mechanic. And I have two that have sort of stemmed from the popularity of that, but definitely take it in two varying uh, different directions. So Caverna was, again, not one I'm featuring, but uh, most directly related to Agricola. And then he kind of went off into some other uh, directions with Aura and Labora and um, Glass Road and... Um, uh, uh, La Havre, which is like a fishing game that has always melted my brain when I tried to play it. Um, but uh, Fields of Arl is one I am talking about, as well as his newest Hallertau. Sure, that is totally how you pronounce it. Hallertau. <laughs> Fields of Arl, I'll talk about first. This is one that came out that was uh, um, one to two player games. So it is mostly played probably as a two player, but it was early on when, before a lot of games were coming out with solitaire variants. So I think it had a lot of initial early fame and popularity because you could play it solitaire and there weren't any rule changes for the solitaire game. You're just trying to beat a very specific score. And yes, for those people watching, it does sort of mean there's not a ton of player interaction in the game and you are sort of having a solitaire farming experience. But um, with two players, there are workers that are getting placed out on the board and spaces that will be taken away from you. So it, it is a different experience with one or two, although the rules do not have to change in order for one player to still have a, a very fulfilling, uh, enriched experience of the game. It is a big player board that has a lot of the spaces where you'll be taking your workers to do the different actions to farm the land. Now, your player boards, you have your own, are going to get filled up with tiles, hopefully, uh, that are different farms or buildings, stables, stalls, have lots of animals, animals in the field, and like a lot of his games, they have the wonderful little animal meeples. This is um, one of my personal favorite animal meeples, is a black and white cow. There are horses and sheeps, and I thought I'd pulled them all out, but apparently not. <laughs> There's also horses and sheep. Imagine them in your mind. Uh, and then goods that you are trying to produce. Uh, wool into wool coats or leather into leather goods like uh, boots. And you're going to be um, traveling along in your vehicles. Did I pull out a vehicle like a very smart, intelligent person that I am? No, I did not. There's <laughs> a box of components over here and I thought I pulled out all the cool stuff. Uh, there's... Uh, carts that you are trying to fill with your goods or your traveling destinations and when you fill up a cart you'll be able to at the end of the turn do that conversion so that you have those goods so that they can be points for you at the end of the game or help you build the uh, uh, help you build the buildings the farms themselves and when you start off there's going to be kind of a, 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 a dike that is built out here that is keeping the water from the uh, from flooding your fields which I'm assuming Arl is one of the low regions of, of Europe and often prone to floods. And you are trying to then advance those so that you can give yourself more room to grow as the game goes on. And like Agricola and a lot of his other games, again, uh, your animals that you have on your farms and your stables, if you have two of them happy in your stables, they'll have a baby in the winter uh, spring phase and in the summer uh, harvesting goods and food that you need uh, or you pay some penalty for not having the food for feeding uh, your yourself, <laughs> your team, your game. So that is Fields of Arles, probably not the largest departure from Agricola, but it is it's very much its own thing, worker placement to build up the farms and to move the dikes and to have more land to use, as well as the, the carts and the goods that go into your barn uh, to uh, transport and con convert things into better goods. And it plays really well with only one player, but it is uh, probably best at two. There was an expansion, which I has I have not um, 
play. I, I really would like to. I believe it adds to a third player, but I could be wrong on that. Uh, someone can correct me in the chat. Uh, I believe it. Yeah, I don't even remember the name of it, but there is an, uh, an expansion to this one to two player game. So that's sort of its popularity. And that's Fields of Arl. That I don't know if I showed the box. It's really pretty. And <laughs> it's this really big box. Um, <laughs> and it's normally $79.95, but it will be 20% off all week. Oh, somebody just learned uh, the latest Rosenberg they learned was Fields of Arl, which is... Um, that's great. I haven't actually played it in a while. I was going to play it last night uh, again just to refresh, uh, and I got tired and watched television and stuff. <laughs> so this is Hallertau, and this is my most recent uh, Uwe Rosenberg game. It's only been out for a couple months. It was a 2020 release. It's even bigger than Fields of Arl. It plays one to four players. I've only played it one to two because it's new during the pandemic. Um, and I love it. <laughs> it's uh, currently my favorite game. That changes all the time, so don't hold me to that a week from now. But like Fields of Arl, it is about farming, but it changes things and makes it quite different. It is worker placement. Instead of me having my worker, all of the workers are these generic blue cubes. And the spaces themselves have one, two, or three spaces for cubes stacked up. And I don't know if I can pull that out. It's a really big board. Okay, it's, it's a medium-sized board. The table space this game takes up is a lot, but they're all a bunch of different little boards that get stacked up around each other. And on that main board, you are placing down one, two, or three workers, depending on the space that is available from your supply. And once it's out there, it doesn't belong to you anymore, and it doesn't matter who put it there. It's just the space is occupied, and you can't take that space with that number of workers anymore. And when you place that worker, then you get some goods. The goods that you get are going to go onto your personal player board, which is your personal little farm. And this is where it's it's pretty uh, unique and different, is you can have just one of a good, or if you get multiples of goods somewhere, you place it up here, indicating that I, in fact, have, what is this, flax? Two flax, or if this is up here, that means I have four flax. So there's a lot of little accounting that goes on here, and you might have multiples of these, like I might have 10 flax, in which case I'd have two blue things up here. And uh, they do get stacked. Um, these little wooden meeples will all get stacked. and You'll be moving them up and down as you spend them. But when you are taking an action, one of those worker actions you can take is to plant a good that's going to go into a field. Now the fields and how they come out and where they're placed and how they move up and down is a whole part of the game. But when you come to harvest, wherever your field is at during harvest is how many you will get. So here I would be getting five flax at the end of that round. So I'm super happy to have harvested that. The fields move up if they're empty uh, before harvest because they weren't used, so they're like gaining nutrients, I don't know. So next round, they'll be great if you can plant something on them, but that takes an action. And then you are collecting these copious amounts of goods for the best and most unique part of this game is, uh, which of course, I should have had this one out instead of Nova Luna, but Nova Luna is so pretty. Uh, <laughs> so this one is your little slider player board and uh, you are going to have, everybody's going to have the same ones and they're going to be these little, uh, I don't know, buildings that you are going to have placed uh, next to here and you want to move these because if you can move all of them over, your whole building will slide over. And as your building slides over in the game, you'll get more workers at the start of the round because the number in the window is how many, I don't know if you can see that, eight workers. But if I can move all my buildings, I get nine workers. So the more goods you collect, the more times you can move your buildings, the more you can move your, uh, your big house. And if you can get even farther down the road, you're gonna be looking at getting some massive victory points uh, for having it slid really far. <laughs> But the other thing that stops you from moving these buildings is uh, there are rules for how you can play and which resources you can spend. So this one is letting you know to move this forward in the first round is going to cost you one good and it's going to cost you brick or wheat. But when you're paying, you have to pay more brick than wheat. So if I only have wheat, I actually can't play it. And I actually can't play it in the second round when everything costs two because I can't play one brick and one wheat, that's not more brick than wheat. That's the same, that's equal. 
Only in the third round could I then start to pay a combination of brick and wheat, because then I could pay one uh, wheat and two brick and move this forward one space in the third round. So each round they get harder to move forward, you need more resources, but you have a better engine going and you have more things in your field and hopefully more things to harvest and you'll be able to move them forward. There are also, uh, again I pulled it out, there's a lot of things, there's boulders, these rocks that you need tools to move the boulders because you can't slide these forward into a boulder and so you have to have a balance between having the tools and the goods to slide everything over and so it's sort of a, um, a timing mechanism, you are trying to uh, figure out uh, which goods to collect in combination with each other. It is really puzzly and I think it's super neat. What I also liked about the game is it's rather intuitive. There wasn't a whole lot of like, I mean, it's a steep learning curve with all the bits and moving bobs and pieces, but it was really intuitive. Like I plant, I harvest, I have that much, I need that much to move this thing plus this boulder and I move it forward. The other element to this game that I didn't even talk about or really pull out is there are a ton of cards. And what I like about the cards in this game is some of them will help you, some of them will give you points, some of them will give you bonuses, but you can play cards at any point on anyone's turn, in the middle of your turn. They, some of them don't have effect or actions until a certain specific time on your turn, but a lot of what is being done between the two players that I played with, or uh, if you play with more, is simultaneous. So you're not waiting and it's not only on your turn that you can decide, okay, if I play this card, you can play down a card and know that you have it and kind of be planning for it when it's not your turn before it comes back to you. The game says you can play this game without using any cards. It still functions with all those good collecting and moving your board forward, but you, um, uh, adding in the cards is also a lot of fun and there's lots of different combinations that you can get and things that you're going for um, and it's nice that you don't have to wait for uh, your turn to figure out which cards you want to play down and and maybe in the middle of your turn you're like oh I could fix my problem by playing this card right now so that is Hallertown oh one last component I didn't show you is you can also get jewelry <laughs> And jewelry is really hard to come by, but if you can get it, you can actually spend one jewel to move forward one of those houses in any round. You don't need like three jewels in round three like you would the goods, you just need one gem to move it forward. So as the game gets harder later on, having more gems can help you, although I don't think I've ever had more than like three at one time, but I've never gone for that strategy. There's lots of different strategies to follow, and um, this is one that I have played a few times solo, which is actually quite rare, so that's just how much I liked it, and I was even able to get my non-Eurogaming husband to play a game uh, of it with me, which was great. So that is also $79.95, but it is also 20% off through Thursday, March 18th. So I'm just going to check the chat here to see if there were any final questions or comments. People admiring, yes, my shelves, thank you. I'm great pride in them and wish I could be playing more of these games with people and <laughs> someday, someday. And, uh, oh, do they have cover crops or is that, oh, cover crops. I'm sure in some of his uh, games there is something along those lines. I don't know if that would be the theme or what is represented here in this one. But yes, so that is uh, designer Uwe Rosenberg. He's got lots of games out there. Um, he's one that I sort of have been intimidated by some of his bigger games in the past, uh, but am now learning to uh, see the connections and combinations from them all and uh, really get a lot of joy out of how solo oriented he makes a lot of his games and how you can play them solitaire. So thank you for tuning in. I didn't see any other uh, games or questions in the chat, but thank you for joining me and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I hope it's plenty sunny wherever you are. Thank you very much.